What's up my pre -cuck people, Michael Princhuk here and in this video I'm going to teach you how to crush the fourth and final free response question of this year's AP pre exam. Now if you want to crush this problem you need to first know exactly what the question is going to look like, know what they're going to ask you, and well know how to solve those questions and that's exactly what I'm going to do in this video. Now on this question you will not be allowed to use a calculator and it is a non-context based question so there's no word problem to it. It's a function analysis problem where it's going to really going to focus on the manipulation manipulation of several different functions. This question has three sections, A, B, and C. Section A has two parts, one point each. Section B has two parts, one point each. And section C has one part worth two points. In section A, you're going to be given two functions and asked to do some solving with those two functions. In part one, you're going to solve the first function. And in part two, you're going to do some solving with the second function. Now, keep in mind, you're not allowed to use your calculator on this question. So you're going to have to show all of your work along the way. And make sure your answers are simplified as much as possible. In section B, you're going to be once again given two new functions. And here you're going to be asked to do some manipulation with these functions to reduce them or simplify them. Now, these questions could be a logarithmic function where you're going to condense them from multiple logs to a single log, could be an exponential function where you're going to simplify down to one base with one exponent, or it could even be a trigonomic function which you're going to use your trigonomic identities to make simpler. And finally, in section C, you're going to be given one more function, and you're going to be asked to find all values in the domain of the function that allow for a given output value. So basically, you're going to have to do some solving. Once again, no calculators, so make sure you show all of your work and simplify your answers as much as possible. All right, let's take a look at several examples of exactly the types of functions I'm talking about and how you're going to solve them for this fourth and final FRQ. So this is similar to what section A is going to look like. You're going to be given two functions, and in each part of section A, you're going to be asked to do some solving. So here are two functions, and in part one, we're asked to solve the first function, g of x equal to 4 for all values in the domain of g. All right, here we go. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take g of x, and we're going to set it equal to 4, and we have log base 3 of 3x plus 2. Now to solve a logarithmic equation, you want to get one log, and you want that single log to be all by itself. So if there's anything around there, you need to move over, move it, but that's already done for us in this particular problem. So the next thing we're gonna do is convert this logarithmic function to an exponential function by taking our base of three, raising it to four, and equaling three x plus two. Again, that's using the definition of logarithms. Remember, logarithms always equal your exponent, so four is the exponent for my base of three. Then I'm gonna subtract two, so I have three to the fourth minus two equals three to the x. Divide both sides by 2, and I get a final, oh, excuse me, divide both sides by 3. I'm so sorry. So I get my final answer that's not complete, but it is a good answer. It's an exact answer at least. 3 to the 4th minus 2, all divided by 3. Now, you're not allowed to use a calculator, but I would hope most students know that 3 to the 4th is 81. So we have 81 minus 2 divided by 3. And 81 minus 2 is 79, so our final answer is 79 thirds. Nice and simple to solve a logarithmic function. All right, in the second part, we're going to be asked to solve the second function, h of x equal to pi for all values in the domain of h. So once again, we're going to take h of x and set it equal to pi. First step is to solve for the trigonomic function sine inverse. So we're going to divide both sides by 6. And then we get pi over 6 equals sine inverse of x. Now, to solve this, you could either remember your inverses. Now, remember, sine inverses, the input value, which is what I'm trying to solve for, is a y-coordinate from the unit circle, and the output, pi over 6, is the angle where that y-coordinate occurs. So basically, we're trying to determine at, at pi over 6, what is our y-coordinate? And if you need to draw a little certain unit circle, whatever you need to do on your exam to remember that at pi over 6, our y-coordinate is 1 half. Therefore, x equals 1 half. Now, another way you could solve this problem is to do the old switcheroo. Switch it from an inverse sign to a regular sign by switching your input and your output. So sine of pi over 6 equals x. And I hope everybody knows how to imagine or draw a unit circle and figure out that sine of pi over 6 equals 1 half. Therefore, 1 half equals x. Now, on the actual exam, section A will only have two functions. But I thought we should look at one more function just to practice solving different functions. Here we solve the logarithmic function, an inverse 
trig function, and now let's solve an exponential function. So here's another example just to throw at you. So we're given w of x equals e to the x raised to the third, all divided by e to the one half, and we're asked to solve where the function equals e to the fourth for all of as the domain of w. So once again, the first thing I'm going to do is set my function equal to e to the fourth. And now what I'm going to do on the right-hand side is use some of my exponent rules to simplify. When you have a power raised to a power, you can multiply. So that's going to be e to the 3x divided by e to the 1 half. Now, when you're dividing with the same base, you could subtract your powers. So I have e to the 4th equals e to the 3x minus 1 half. Now what I could use what's called the one-to-one -one property. Basically, when your bases on each side of an equation are the same, then your exponents must also be the same. Therefore, 4 must equal 3x minus 1 half. And now I could solve this equation really easily. First thing I'm going to do is add 1 half. So I get 4 plus 1 half equals 3x. Now, I would prefer that you leave this as a fraction, so we're going to look at that 4 as 8 halves. Therefore, 8 halves plus 1 half is 9 halves. You guys should all be able to do that. And then we're going to divide both sides by 3, which is the same thing as multiplying both sides by 1 third. And if we multiply both sides by 1 third, we get 9 6, which is, of course, going to reduce to 3 halves. So we get our final answer of 3 halves equals x. Nice and simple. Now, section B is going to offer you two more functions. So here we go. We have function m of x and function k of x. And we're going to be asked to do some simplification or manipulation to simplify these functions. So part one is going to ask you to rewrite m of x as a single logarithm, log base 2 of something, but one log with base 2. So we have to use our rules here. Now, we remember our rules, hopefully to condense logs together. So let's start with the first part right here, the log base 2 of x minus 3 minus 4 log base 2 x plus 1. When you're subtracting logs, you can divide the logs. So we get log base 2, but inside we get x minus 3 divided by x plus 1. That is one of our log rules that when you're subtracting two logs, you can bring them together with division on the inside. And then over here, I'm going to take the 3, and I'm going to put it up as an exponent using my power rule. So we have plus log base 2 of x to the third. Now I'm going to use one more rule, and that's the addition rule, which is going to bring the addition of two logs together with multiplication. So we have m of x equals log base 2 of x minus 3 times x cubed, all divided by x plus 1. And all of that is inside the log. Now, we could that's good enough for what the question asked, to rewrite it as a single log. But we could clean it up a little bit more. We could actually distribute the log, or excuse me, distribute the x cubed in the numerator. So we get log base 2 of x to the fourth minus 3x to the cubed, all divided by x plus 1. Again, don't have to do that, but it is one way to simplify it a little bit more. But we have accomplished our task of creating one log base 2 in one particular value inside of that. In this case, x to the fourth minus 3x cubed, all divided by x plus 1. I cannot guarantee that one of the two functions in section B is going to be a logarithmic function, but I would say I'm 99% confident that's going to happen, so please make sure you know how to use those log rules. All right, in the second part of section B, you're simply going to be asked to reduce or simplify or manipulate that second equation, in, or the second function, in this case, k of x. Now here we're asked to rewrite k of x as a product involving only cotangent and cosine. So let's see how we could do that. We are gonna have to know our trigonomic identities. Now these identities are not gonna be on any kind of form issue for you. You do have to kind of memorize them. Now a lot of teachers will say, you don't need to memorize them, you need to understand them. Whatever, you need to know them, let's put it that way. So cosecant, I'm going to use the quotient identity, or not, excuse me, I'm going to use one of the reciprocal identities. Cosecant can be written as 1 over sine of x minus sine of x. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a common denominator and subtract these two things together, these two terms together. So my common denominator is going to be sine of x. Remember to get a common denominator, the easiest way is just to multiply the two denominators you have. So my two denominators are sine of x and 1, multiply them and you get sine of x. Now, this first term, 1 over sine of x, already has that common denominator, so I'm going to leave a 1 right there. This back term needs a sine of x to get the common denominator, but if I multiply the 
the denominator, I'm gonna have to also multiply the numerator. So I get minus sine squared of x. Now at this point, I should recognize one minus sine squared of x really quickly. You guys should all know the most important trigonomic identity, the Pythagorean identity, that cosine squared plus sine squared equals one. So if I subtract the sine squared over, one minus sine squared equals cosine squared of x. All right, so I'm slowly getting closer to what the question asks, but I'm almost done. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna separate that cosine squared to cosine times cosine of x. Sorry for my sloppy handwriting there. All divided by sine of x. Now, we know that cosine divided by sine is cotangent. So I could take that cosine and sine away and turn that into a cotangent of x. And I'm gonna be multiplying that by a cosine of x left over. So I've accomplished the task. I have rewritten this function as a product multiplication of cotangent and cosine. And you got to show all of your work, nice and simple. Now, once again, section B is only gonna have two functions, but for the, you know, for the use of this video, I thought I should do one more problem with you, especially these trick problems, they could be a little bit tricky with these identities. So here's a second one. Again, this would just be like another function that you might see in section B. Here we're gonna, once again, we're gonna rewrite this function, k of x, but we're only one to involve cosine. So here we go. All right, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to change cosecant to one over sine of x, that's one of our reciprocal identities. And then I'm going to change tangent to sine of x over cosine of x. That is one of the quotient identities. And look how simple this works out. The sines of x are gonna to reduce to a one and I simply get one over cosine of x. Now that is my, my final answer because they did want me to rewrite this involving only cosine of x. Now one over cosine of x is also equivalent to secant of x. That would actually be a little bit simpler, but it did send the directions to involve only cosine of x. So there's my final answer, nice and easy. So make sure you know those trigonomic identities. And what's the harm in looking at one more possible function that could be in section B, and that's an exponential function like this. And the directions are to rewrite f of x as an expression of the form three raised to the ax plus b. So they want me to rewrite f of x with one base and they want that one base to be three and there's going to be a power in the form of ax plus b and I need to figure out what a and b are. So here we go. This is a really good problem. All right, the first thing I gotta do is I gotta change all of my bases to base three. The denominator is already taken care of for me. That's pretty easy, three to the first. Base three, nice and simple, exponent of one. Now, 27 is written as three cubed. So I'm gonna rewrite 27 as three cubed. I hope everybody knows three cubed is 27. That's a fairly easy one. But don't forget the power that was already on the 27 of two x. And then I'm gonna rewrite nine as three squared. I hope everybody knows that nine is three squared. And then don't forget the x plus two. All right, now that I got all the same bases, I have to use a couple of my exponent rules to simplify. When you have a power raised to a power, you multiply. So I have three raised to the six x, and that's because I multiplied the three and the two x. And then I have three raised to two x plus four. Once again, I multiplied the two and the x plus two. Just be careful to distribute that two. That's where I got the two x plus four from. Now the one more thing I'm actually gonna do next is I'm going to bring the three in the denominator up to the numerator with the negative one. Nice and easy, hope everybody knows how to do that. Now, when you are multiplying with the same base, you can add all of those powers together and leave one base. So I have my one base of three and I'm gonna add six x plus two x plus four plus negative one. Once I combine all, whoa, what's going on there? Sorry about that. I'm gonna get six x plus two x is eight x, four plus negative one is three, so I've accomplished my task of writing this as one base, three, and raised to the eight x plus three. So A is eight and B is three. Nice and simple. Now finally in part C, you're gonna be given one function and asked to do some solving with it. So here's an example of M of X equals two sine of X minus pi over three. And we wanna find all values of X in the domain of M that yield an output value of radical three. So here we go, we're gonna take radical three and we're gonna set it equal to two sine of x minus pi over three. All right, first step is to isolate the trigonomic function sine. So I'm gonna divide both sides by two and I get radical three divided by two equals sine of x minus pi over three. 
Now, so many kids want to add pi over three at this point, but I can't. I have to remember that this input, x minus pi over three, is an angle. I first need to figure out what that angle could be to produce an output of radical three over two. Then I can worry about adding the pi over three. So now I'm gonna think about my unit circle. Where is sine radical three over two? We'll hope everybody remembers that sine is radical three over two at pi over three. So that's gonna be one possibility. And the other possibility of where sine is radical three over two on the unit circle is two pi over three. But there are many, many more answers because I could take that pi over three and I could add two pi as many times as I want, that n being an integer, so I could add two pi as many times as I want, and I'll get more and more answers. So officially, my answer is x or pi over three plus two pi over n equals, well, the angle. But the angle's not just x. The angle I'm looking for is x minus pi over three. Same thing with the two pi over three. That is an answer on the unit circle that I can visually see from zero to two pi. But if I add two pi n, I will get infinite more answers. Once again, that n represents an integer that allows me to add as many rotations, positive or negative as I want. And that again could equal the x minus pi over three. So if my missing angle that I have highlighted in yellow is either pi over three plus two pi n or two pi over three plus two pi n, I will get an output of radical three over two. Now I could go ahead and add the pi over three to each side. Add pi over three, add pi over three. Now when I add that pi over three, I get pi over three plus pi over three, which is gonna be two pi over three. So I get two pi over three plus two pi n equals x. That is one particular answer that represents the infinite possibilities. Same thing over here, I'm gonna add pi over three, I'm gonna add pi over three. Two pi over three plus pi over three is gonna be three pi over three, which reduces to just pi. So I get pi plus two pi n equals x as well. So those are my two solutions that actually represent the infinite solutions to this particular function equation. So once again, notice how I did that. If I only wanted answers from zero to two pi, that's all I want. I only want to answer the 2 to 2 pi. I would not need the 2 pi n. I'm adding that 2 pi n to represent that there's infinite places, co-terminal angles, where I would have that output value of radical 3 over 2. Hopefully that makes sense. I know a lot of students do struggle with those types of problems, so be very careful. Now, on your actual exam, section C is only going to have one function and one question. But again, for the sake of review video, I thought, why not? Let's look at another. So here's another example of what section C could look like. M of X equals inverse tangent of radical five pi X. Find all values of X in the domain of M that yield an output of cosine inverse of one half. Oh boy. Okay, the first thing I wanna figure out is what is cosine inverse of one half? Cause that's kind of a confusing, but I can actually figure out what that is. Hope everybody's okay with figuring this out, but cosine inverse of one half is pi over six. Oh no, no, excuse me. Oh my gosh, can't believe I said that. Pi over three, so easy to get those confused. But on the unit circle from zero to two pi, where do we see a cosine value of one half? Where do we see an x coordinate of one half? That happens at pi over three. Now you can also argue that that happens at five pi over three, but remember inverse cosine is limited in terms of it's only allowed to look from zero to pi. So the only answer for cosine inverse of one half is pi over three. All right, so now that I understood that, I'm gonna take that value, pi over three, and I'm gonna set it equal to inverse tangent of radical five pi x. All right, now to solve this, I'm gonna pull what I call the old switcheroo. I can turn an inverse tangent into a regular tangent as long as I switch my inputs and my outputs. So therefore, tangent of pi over three equals radical five pi x. It's that simple, pretty easy. Now what I need to do is figure out what tangent of pi over three is. Now hopefully remember tangent is the y coordinate divided by the x coordinate. So if you need to draw a quick little unit circle and say, okay, here's pi over three. I know that the x value is one half and the y value is radical three over two. Now tangent is the y divided by the x. So if I take the y radical three over two and I divide by one half, which is the same as multiplying by the reciprocal, I get radical three. Therefore, tangent of pi over three is radical three equals radical five pi x. 
All right, I only have one more thing left to do to solve for x, and that's to divide both sides by radical 5 pi. Divide both sides by radical 5 pi. A little bit ugly, but x equals radical 3 divided by radical 5 times pi. Now you can actually leave that as your final answer, or if you really wanted to rationalize the denominator, you could multiply both the numerator and the denominator by radical five, and that's gonna produce radical 15 over five pi as another possible answer that you could have for full credit. Kind of an ugly answer to, honestly, kind of an ugly problem, but it's a really good problem because they're gonna test your ability to first know how to solve an inverse cosine. That way you can actually get a numerical value for what that is, in this case, pi over three. And then you're gonna set that equal to an inverse tangent and you need to know how to solve an inverse tangent by again pulling what I call the old switcheroo, switching my inputs and my outputs so I could use a regular tangent. All right, that's it for FRQ4. FRQ4, most kids that I've spoken to, that I have in class, think it's actually pretty challenging, but I think it's pretty easy if you just focus on the fact of what you're gonna be doing. Part A, or section A, you're just gonna be doing some solving. Section B, you're gonna be doing some manipulations, so make sure you know your exponent rules, your log rules, and your trig identities. And in part C, you just have to know how to solve a pretty good problem. Typically, it's gonna be trigonomic. It doesn't have to be, at least there's nothing that says that. But from a lot of the practice exams I've seen, part C is a trigonomic function, whether it be a regular trig function or an inverse trig function. So just make sure you're comfortable solving those. All right, good luck and best of luck on the exam.